we don't really talk about any, if you think about it we don't really talk about anything in the black community in like nigerian culture we don't really talk about anything apart from soiree it's for anything it's education job family and then marriage whatever and then live your life work retire die the only way i knew i was black is because i didn't have another english name so people would point it out to me where are you from <laughs> I was born here, but where are your parents from? Basically asking the same question twice. That's how I, I think I knew it in the first place, was my name. Issues of race were very, very much to the fore. We were often dealing with the results of trauma, and that trauma included racist bullying. So for, for black patients of ours, there will be a history, of course, of growing up black in Britain, and the whole issue of alienation Black men are disproportionately likely to be locked up and we're less likely to receive counselling, more likely to be put on medication. So it's not just the fact that we are suffering disproportionately, our treatment suffers. A lot of people don't realise that being black can affect your mental health and yeah it has a massive impact and I think a lot of black people who do struggle with mental health don't even realise that that is a part of it as well. I've always had um, issues with, and I'll be very honest with you, like I've always had issues with depression, intrusive thoughts and suicide. From a very young age and then more so when I turned 14 it became more like prevalent and um, I mean I didn't really know what it was then I just knew that I was always upset and like had these like being very neurotic about the way you know I thought my family saw me and so yeah it's been it's a continuous battle whilst I think I it could be massively beneficial for me to actually speak to someone who's the same race as me it's bittersweet basically because I think the world of psychology and mental health is institutionally very white. There hasn't been a lot of research or understanding of how race and trauma with race mm. affects that. At the same time, I don't want it to, I don't want to like not be able to get help, but I also have struggled with talking to my therapist about issues about being black because I'm kind of embarrassed about it. Only in the last three years did I realise that race had a massive, massive part to play in my mental health. Mm. It was kind of this realisation and then it was like, shit, <laughs> like, what do I do now? Like, how do I talk about it? There is a, a lack of provision of therapists from the BME community. Why is that? I mean, I mean, obviously people have to choose to go into that, but then when you look at the training uh, for um, therapists, there is a barrier there for people who aren't wealthy. It's expensive. And given the um, general, I'm speaking very, very generally, the kind of uh, uh, fact that the BME community as a whole tends to be less well off than, than the white majority, um, I think it's quite, it's quite difficult for people. Um, certainly there were moves to try to improve that in London when I was working there. Um, and there were specialist agencies offering um, therapy for the BME community by BME therapists. But I think there's just, there's certainly, there just isn't enough BME therapists out there. Even, well, even myself, when there was a time I did go to the doctors, 
the person didn't listen to me. She just said, okay, pills. <laughs> and I was like, nah, <laughs> nah. She heard like three things. Didn't ask me about those three things. So I was like, I don't care if you're a doctor or not. Sometimes people can lie to you about a cold <laughs> and you give them medicine. Someone could lie to you about getting out of work and you give them what you think they need. So right now, you have a question, talk through nothing, and you're not a therapist, so I'm not doing that. I made that decision really quickly. There's a lot of trauma that's heaped on certain identities, and we can't ignore how that plays into our experience of mental health. So I think Samara put it really well at one of the talks we did, where she said that um, people say that mental health doesn't discriminate, but it does, because we live in a world that discriminates. I was being taught about issues of race and mental health by, by white people. Um, I didn't have any black um, lecturers when I was doing my studies to be a mental health nurse. Um, you kind of learn on the job. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, just not enough of it. I watched the match of the day. <laughs> I support Arsenal, so I thought, oh, let's see what's happening. Arsenal Wenger's going to go soon, isn't it? So let's watch it. Before match of the day, the tone changed. Since Christmas, there's been about 15, 16 deaths. I think, personally, there's always been more. That's what the news cover. <laughs> they don't want to tell you that there's more, because that sounds like, why isn't anyone doing anything about it? When they spoke about two deaths, in Harrow, on the same road, they spoke about a death in Lewisham around the corner from me, because I'm in Broccoli. They spoke about um, a death, I think, in Hackney. They were speaking to his mum on the day it happened. He spoke about this like it was a book. Like, oh my God, I can't believe these things happened. Blah, 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 blah. I can't remember the guy's name. He's a person of colour. He's on the news, he's talking about these things. But when it gets to the old woman, older woman who's speaking about this, she said something completely true. And she said that if people don't have anywhere to go, they're failed, you need to give them something to do. There's nothing around, much around here anymore. They don't care about her saying that. They cut the news. They went to the mum. <laughs> they saw her crying. They saw her barely able to talk. I think she said about two sentences that her son was very, very involved in community, he was bright and he had potential. He was handsome. That's all she was able to actually say because she, she hasn't been able to grieve, it's been a couple of hours. <laughs> what did they do again? Cut the news, went to the police. The police will be increasing their force and presence. That doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. That just stirs more anger. <laughs> that doesn't do anything. Um, every time something has happened, what they choose to do is increase police presence not understand what is going on to actually reform a community. That's why every eight or 10 years, when they finally flush out the people through gentrification, finally flush out the people through putting all the people in prison, it just comes back every eight or 10 years. It's actually every eight or 10 years, it gets worse or repeats itself. Eight or 10 years ago, it was my crime, post-Cold Wars. It's not just post-Cold Wars. <laughs> Don't reduce it to post-Cold Wars, it's rude. It is, these are the things that happen in inner city London, outside of London, in places where people are grouped in social housing. This is what happens. Those kind of things really are upsetting as a person with lived experience. You don't want to hear that is how police treat you, especially as a person that will, if you're looking to, to do any social change, you may have to work with a police person. You may have to work with politicians that don't understand you. There is no way you cannot change a structure by not understanding it and not engaging in it. As nasty, as hard as it is. That itself, engaging with it and speaking about it and learning it can mess with your mental health. It's a lot. Because sometimes someone asks you a simple question like, how are you? That was a question that after a while I used to just turn my head upside down, inside out, put it in a tumble dryer. <laughs> 
because I could not explain what, for example, invisibility meant. I couldn't explain what that meant. I didn't even know that you could use that word to describe how you are <laughs> or explain your mental health rather. But now um, I've come to an understanding that um, people do want to help you, but they don't know how to. And that is the issue. And I think that um, in terms of a lot of things to do with race relations, sometimes it's, it's really weird because sometimes it's like you would rather be completely misunderstood than half understood. It's worse. The Colour of Madness is a book I'm currently editing alongside a friend of mine, Samara Linton, and it's due for publication in August and it's an anthology about BME mental health. It's a collection of poetry, art, fiction, essays, um, all by and about um, black, Asian and minority ethnic experiences within either the mental health care system or with their own mental health or the cultural differences that make mental health harder to deal with or harder to access healthcare. So it's basically um, adding to the current narrative about mental health and removing the whitewashing, like yeah. an understanding that mental health is something that affects everyone and that it's not just a white problem. There's a stigma around mental health, um, something that I didn't under something that I didn't actually understand until about two, three years ago, um, when I, I was going through like a stressful period with uni, with church and just with personal life, like I was just worried about everything, anxious about everything. And I didn't understand how much was affecting me. And you know, I would tell my mom, she'd be like, mom's amazing, but she'd just be like, I'll just pray, it'll be fine. You know, and prayer obviously helped because you're obviously meditating on something else for a long a while, but then you go back to those, those, that same thinking. And I, I struggled with the idea that, okay, praying it away would make it go away, but I'm still left with this, with this feeling. It's incredible how depression can take its toll on, it can drain you of every single emotion, even to the point of tiredness. You can't even stay awake for a certain amount of hours. You just want to drown in your emotional like darkness. Thankfully, it didn't last like very long um, because I feel like you have to, you have to find something within yourself to just to like really get yourself up. Even if it's like dedicating yourself to doing one thing a day, you know, if it's just getting up, making sure you get up in the morning, make sure you do that. If it's like eating, make sure you do that. Even after two more weeks, it's like going for a walk, like really setting yourself mini goals that allows you to feel like you've achieved something that's of greatness. I had um, done a lot of things, um, making masks, sculptures, uh, mixed media, and I got into art really because of my mental health. I wasn't particularly keen on the workshops to begin with because art was something I did for me. <laughs> um, it wasn't something to show people and I was never ever intended on being an artist. But wanting to put on an exhibition made me have to just work with people in the community. Um, as I did that more and more, it turned into exhibitions, it turned into workshops, the workshops turned into art therapy. Just because you listen to what people want if you want them to come back. <laughs> yeah. And my work was on tables, stood up. So it wasn't conventional, but it was still high quality work coming to an estate. So imagine you had a community space on this estate and you had a free workshop to go to. What I found was people need it, they want to see it, and they want to come back. <laughs> and that, that's what helps me to keep doing it, I think. Yeah, it's the widen perspective. That's what it's really about. Film is the perfect form of like escapism for me because you know, I get to live it, live through somebody else's life and like live through their own different emotions and that maybe I've never felt before. Life modeling makes me feel really good. I've been doing it for the last three years and when I started it wasn't it was actually in a period where I was very confident in myself and I was very confident in my body and like self-esteem and it's always fluctuated as it always will but um, whenever I do it I feel amazing. Even though you know you're naked in a room with 14 people but they're all saying you know you're really beautiful like thank you so much for doing this like you know and then you see their artwork and you, they're so different, the styles, the way they see me and it's like, oh, there isn't just one look that I'm supposed to have. So I would say people that live in council housing, people that live anywhere, just look 
at something else other than yourself. I'm privileged because of my art, privileged because of my interests. That has taken to me to places where um, things outside of myself happen. It's simple as that. But it's, it's not simple to someone else that is doing a nine to five and that's the life. That's where the, the disconnect comes because they're not actually connected to anything else than what they do. I've made a space for myself. And sometimes it's not possible. It hasn't been possible for a long time for me financially, but that's something that I would promote to anyone. Find a space where you can exist outside yourself. As I always said, in terms of creativ creatively, someone's cooking right now, right? That person is concentrating on the food. That's actually what I do with art. There's a myth that creativity is painting, music, film. It's not just that. If I was a single parent father tomorrow, I had 10 pounds in my account and my child for Monday needs new shoes, I'm gonna find a way to make that happen. That's using your creativity. <laughs> you need to do creative things every day that give you a break, especially in this society where things are so quickly produced, come consumer so quickly. I think that the, the months seem to go quick, pay seems to go quick as I get older. You have to give yourself a break from that, surely. What was a cure for, for my, my mental health has become like a passion in terms of like um, for like work and for like um, meeting a network of people that is breathing. Um, and so I'm quite thankful for that period in a sense because it allowed me to like really think about what it is that I wanted to do. It's amazing how your path can kind of change through one incident or one. Incident.